Lecture 10, Bone Growth, Remodeling, and Repair. It is important to remember that bone is a very dynamic and vascular tissue that constantly grows and develops. We actually keep growing our skeleton and developing it until the age of 25, but it also continues to remodel and repair itself throughout your adult life. Before six weeks of development, the skeleton is cartilage. Cartilage cells will be replaced by bone cells during this time period, and this is called ossification. Osteogenesis begins in utero about 40 days or six weeks after fertilization, when previously cartilaginous or mesenchymal tissues undergo a transformation to osseous tissue. This process is, of course, ossification. By the addition of calcium salts to the matrix, we start to solidify this material. Calcification is, of course, the deposition of calcium ions into the bone tissue. We'll start looking at the two major types of ossification, and then we'll look at the continuation of bone growth after birth and the remodeling process. Finally, we're going to explore fractures and the effects of aging on bone growth and development. There are two types of ossification, intramembranous ossification and endochondral ossification. In short, intramembranous ossification is involved in the development of the clavicle, mandible, skull, and face. It descends down from the dermis, the deep dermis. Endochondral ossification is involved in the limbs, vertebrae, and hips, and this starts from a hyaline cartilage blueprint. First, we will look at intramembranous ossification. We'll start with intramembranous ossification. It begins when stem cells differentiate into osteoblasts within embryonic or fibrous connective tissues. This happens in the deepest layers of the dermis. Bones are called dermal bones here, or membrane bones. And examples of these are the roofing bones of the skull, lower jaw, collarbone, and the sesamoid bones of the patella. Looking at the steps of uh, intramembranous ossification, we begin at an ossification center. An ossification center is simply where the stem cells secrete an osteoid matrix. This happens about eight, eight weeks post-fertilization in the developing dermis, and the stem cells begin to aggregate and enlarge. They differentiate and form into osteoblasts. Remember, the building cells of bone. These osteoblasts release osteoid and begin to calcify the connective tissue. This forms our first ossification center. There may be more than one in any developing dermal bones. From here, bones will grow out into small struts called spicules. These are going to be the formations of trabecular bone that will start to actually form. As it does so, osteoblasts are going to become trapped in the matrix that they've been secreted, and they mature into osteocytes. From here, blood vessels grow along the spicules. Blood vessels will enter the area, and the bone spicules meet and fuse. Blood vessels will become trapped in the developing bone. There is continued deposition of bone by osteoblasts, and they close around that blood vessel. This results in spongy bone being interwoven into the blood vessels. From here, remodeling continuously occurs. Initially, it starts off as spongy bone, but the remodeling will keep occurring until it starts to become compact bone over time as the osteoblasts become fused and turn into osteocytes. Here we can see a sample of how we move through the different steps. We have the osteoblast descending from the stem cells as they start to secrete the osteoid matrix and gradually grow and thicken over time, forming the spicules. Then we see the blood vessels becoming trapped in the matrix of bone and forming thicker and thicker until it finally solidifies with the blood vessels becoming trapped within the bone matrix. Here we see a histological slide of the same thing with the cells descending down from the deep dermis. We see the deep dermal layers growing underneath the skin as it pushes out and the spicules are forming. Note the osteoblasts are going to be around the edges of the spicules as it gradually builds out from there. The short steps to make things a little bit easier are that stem cells will split out from the dermis. They secrete osteoid and become osteoblasts. The osteoblasts create spicules of bone, and the osteoblasts then become trapped, becoming osteocytes. From there, spongy bone becomes remodeled into compact bone.
intramembranous ossification and development begins during the eighth week of uh, embryonic development, as we stated, and we can see ossification centers and progressing bone formation at 10 weeks. At 16 weeks, most of the bones of the adult skeleton can be identified. Here we can see the difference between 10 weeks to 16 weeks of development and the formation of many of the flat bones of the skull have already begun. The next type of ossification is called endochondral ossification. The major difference here is that endochondral ossification tends to focus on long bones. And it begins, instead of the deep dermis, from a hyaline cartilage blueprint. The initial skeleton of the embryo is formed of hyaline cartilage. The cartilage is gradually replaced by bone through endochondral ossification. Endo meaning inside and chondro meaning cartilage. We use the cartilage as a model or a blueprint from which to start. Here the bone will grow in diameter and in length. The diameter of growth is involving appositional bone deposition, so it starts to thicken in diameter overall, much like how cartilage did before and rings of a tree form. Going through the steps, first the cartilage model will enlarge, and this happens around six weeks. The proximal limbs are formed but are comprised entirely of hyaline cartilage. These cartilaginous limbs continue to grow via appositional growth and interstitial growth as they push out. During cartilage enlargement, the chondrocytes near the center of the shaft start to enlarge and then explode. They die and disintegrate, leaving behind a space that is to be filled with bone, uh, bone tissue. Blood vessels will grow around the edges of this cartilage model and then begin to pierce into the center structure. This is going to be the primary ossification center. The blood vessels penetrating the cartilage and enter the central region. Here, those differentiating osteoblast, uh, fibroblasts differentiate into osteoblasts, and they begin spongy bone production at the primary ossification center. The bone formation spreads along the shaft to, towards both ends. The growth will continue along with remodeling as the medullary cavity becomes enlarged and keeps going from end to end. From here, we then have capillaries and osteoblasts that migrate to the epiphysis of each end of the long bone. This creates a secondary ossification center. It goes through the same growing process as the primary ossification center. It just happens later. The, ep the epiphyses will fill with spongy bone and the articular cartilage will remain on the exposed joint cavity. This means that we have that articular surface to allow for a reduction of friction when the two bones are going to meet. Then we have the epiphyseal cartilage that separates the epiphysis from the diaphysis where the metaphysis is. This is going to grow later on during puberty. Looking at some of the pictures, we can see it here. We have enlarging chondrocytes within the calcifying matrix of the hyaline cartilage model, and they begin to grow, explode, and die, leaving behind a space. From there, the fibroblasts will differentiate from the perichondrium and start to descend into the actual cavity that has been left by the decayed chondrocytes. Blood vessels will pierce through the diaphysis, and as the blood vessels pierce through the diaphysis, we have a primary ossification center that is born. Blood vessels are going to be continually depositing a lot of the calcium ions that we need in order to enlarge this area, and osteoblasts will lay down this foundation. The osteoblast will continue to push out and expand the medullary cavity as it grows, and blood vessels will grow along, supplying these nutrients as is necessary. Once the diaphysis has formed a solid base, we have the same thing that begins to occur in each epiphysis, creating a secondary ossification center. Osteoblasts will differentiate from the perichondrium and will start depositing osteoid around, thickening the bone matrix as blood vessels pierce through this area. Articular cartilage will remain made of hyaline cartilage on the articular surface to allow for better movement between two bones. Spongy bone will, of course, be in that, the epiphysis of each end and will continually be remodeled and thickened as compact bone replaces it. Here we can see the thickening of the skeleton going from some of the early weeks of pregnancy at six weeks as it gets out to 16 weeks and the bones continually thicken. Appositional bone growth is much like appositional cartilage growth in that it's going to be adding rings to a tree. 
Here we can see the difference between an infant, a child, a young adult, and a full adult, with the medullary cavity continuing to grow and continuing to thicken over time. This bone wall will continue to thicken well into adulthood and in, until old age. Now, looking at some of the shortcut steps to review endochondral ossification, we start from a hyaline cartilage model, and the chondrocytes die and leave space. Stem cells, descending from the perichondrium, will turn into osteoblasts, and they create bone in the shaft. Blood vessels will push into the medullary cavity, and then osteoblasts lay down osteoid and spicules. Here, the primary ossification center expands. Then, a secondary ossification center begins in the epiphysis, and they are created. This is the same process as the shaft, and you can revisit some of the same shaft processes. When we seek to increase bone diameter, it grows via appositional growth. Here, new layers of cir circumferential lamellae are being added to the outer surface. As diameter increases, deeper circumferential lamellae are replaced by osteons, which remain between the different osteons. So we're going to have different space in between these. Where blood vessels lie along the surface, bone formation leads to the, the development of ridges running parallel to the blood vessels. Eventually, the ridges wrap completely around the blood vessel, encasing it in a tunnel of bone, as can be seen here. These are going to be called Havarsian canals or Volkmann's canals. These tunnels are lined by what was periosteum, and the osteoprogenitor cells in the periosteum differentiate into osteoblasts, which lay down concentric lamellae to produce osteon around the blood vessels. Here we can see as it continues to form an osteon around the Havarsian canal. As the outer diameter increases, osteoclasts are active in the medullary cavity. They are dissolving trabecular bone and enlarging the medullary cavity overall. This would be a finished piece of bone where we have nutrient arteries and veins that start to extend directly into the bone itself. To remain healthy and active, bones require an extensive vascular network of arteries and veins. It is interesting to see how this occurs despite the seemingly impenetrable hard matrix of bone. So it seems to grow in, they grow with each other. The nutrient arteries and veins are the major blood vessels that penetrate the developing bone at the outset of endochondral ossification. There is usually just one nutrient artery and one nutrient vein that enter the diaphysis via the nutrient foramen. Some bones do have more than one pair of nutrient blood vessels, but they're typically larger bones. The nutrient blood vessels divide into many branches that supply most of the bone. We have, of course, metaphysial and epiphysial vessels that descend into the different portions of the bone as well. As we start to grow, the epiphysis is going to separate and then elongate, and this will, of course, cause blood vessels to elongate as well. Another important thing to remember is that bones are important mineral reservoirs. The minerals are inorganic compounds and inorganic ions that contribute to the osmotic balance of body fluids. They're vital in many physiological processes. One of the most important ones that we talk about is calcium, of course. And bones contain 99% of the body's calcium. The rest is going to be dissolved in different fluids in the extracellular. 67% of bone is an inorganic compound with only 33% being organic compounds and most of that being collagen. Now, calcium, as I've said, is one of the most important minerals in the body. It is the most abundant, and it makes up about 1 to 2 kilograms or 2 to 4 pounds of our total weight. 99% again is deposited in the skeleton, and it serves a variety of physiological functions. It's involved in muscle contraction in both skeletal as well as heart. It's involved in blood coagulation and hemostasis and nerve impulse generation, primarily at the axon terminals. The concentration variation is greater than... 30 to 35 percent, it can affect neuron and muscle function. So we need to make sure that our ion balance is kept in check. A normal daily fluctuation is less than 10 percent in total calcium concentration in the blood. Now we maintain calcium levels in a few different ways. We control it through the activities of the intestine, the bone, and the kidneys. The intestines are going to absorb calcium and phosphate. The bones are are going to be a storage site for this. So we can either lay down new bone or we can release existing bone and open up that calcium. And kidneys are gonna be involved in the different levels of absorption or secretion and 
the intestines and the kidneys are going to be involved primarily with hormonal control. Now, there's two hormones that are antagonistic to one another that will control the deposition of calcium and blood calcium levels. First is parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone is produced by the parathyroid gland and stimulates osteoblast and clast activity and calcium absorption in the intestines. The end result of parathyroid hormone is to increase blood calcium levels. So it's secreted from the parathyroid gland, and in bones, osteoclasts will erode the bone matrix to uh, release stored calcium. In the intestines and kidneys, we, re we absorb, or in kidneys, reabsorb calcium into the body. So it's going to increase absorption of calcium. Antagonistically to this is calcitonin. Calcitonin is going to be released from the thyroid gland and the C cells there, and it performs the opposite it is going to lower blood calcium levels. Here, osteoclast activity is inhibited in the bones, whereas osteoblast activity is stimulated, and calcium is deposited in the bone matrix. The intestines are going to stop calcium absorption or decrease it, and in kidneys, it's going to inhibit calcium reabsorption. So calcitonin will lower blood calcium levels. Parathyroid hormone will raise blood calcium levels. Now, there are a few other things besides parathyroid hormone and calcitonin that can actually affect the blood calcium levels as well as the formation of bone. There are vitamins as well as other hormones. Vitamins that we'd be looking at are A, C, and D. Vitamin A is going to be essential in the development of osteoblasts and is dietary. Vitamin C is required for correct formation of collagen fibers, and severe vitamin C deficiency can lead to the condition known as scurvy. Whereas vitamin D is going to be responsible for calcium absorption in the intestines and the regulation of calcium and phosphate in the blood. It's necessary for the production of calcitonin, which we've already discussed. Vitamin D deficiency can lead to rickets in children as well, and this is a softening of the bones. Vitamin D has now been enriched in uh, vitamin D or whole milk to help to stop the occurrence of rickets. Other hormones that are involved in bone growth is growth hormone, which hence its name, stimulates growth and remodeling of bone and is released a lot during puberty, but also throughout a lot of your adult life until you get into older age. And sex hormones. This includes estrogen and testosterone. Here we have a dramatic increase of bone growth during puberty that stimulates the increased osteoblast, it's stimulated by increased osteoblast activity and the release of these hormones. This results in ossification of the epiphyseal plates. In adults, these hormones help to maintain a healthy bone mass. The final thing that we'll talk about with respect to bone growth and development is going to be fractures before we get to old age. Now, fractures are cracks or breaks in the bone due to extreme mechanical stress. It's tissue that can't handle the work that's placed upon it. Most fractures are going to heal as long as blood supply and cellular parts of the periosteum and endosteum survive. Repair involves four steps. The first step of bone repair is a fracture hematoma formation. A large clot will close the injured vessels and develops within several hours to help stop the bleeding. From there, we go into callus formation. There are two calluses, an internal callus, which is a network of spongy bone, and an external callus, which is composed of cartilage as well as bone. These calluses are designed to stabilize and unite the different points of fracture and to help start the cleanup process. The next step is spongy bone formation. Here, the cartilage of the external callus is replaced by spongy bone, and the bone fragments and dead bone are removed and replaced with macrophages. The ends of the fracture are held firmly in place while they can start to solidify and move to the final step, which is compact bone formation. Spongy bone is replaced by compact bone, and the remodeling over time eliminates evidence of the fracture. Here we can see all of the different steps of fracture repair, from the fracture hematoma, where blood begins to clot and thicken in the area, followed by callus formation. We notice the internal callus of spongy bone and the external callus of bone as well as cartilage. During this time period, we start to clean up some of the fr bone fragments as we move into spongy bone formation, where the bone is uniting the two portions of internal and external, and finally, it solidifies into an external callus in compact bone formation.
Now, there are a few different types of fractures. There are closed or simple, which are only internal. We don't break through the skin. And there are open or compound. These project through the skin. Now, open or compound fractures are a bit more dangerous, and this is due to infection or uncontrolled bleeding. We also have transverse fractures. These are going to break along the long axis. Spiral fractures, which are produced by twisting stress, and they go across the length of the bone. It'll look like a stick has been twisted apart. Displaced fractures are going to produce very abnormal bone arrangements, and they typically are going to um, move apart from each other. Non-displaced fractures retain their normal alignment, and they don't separate. Commuted fractures are going to be a shattering of those produced fragments. So let's take a look at a few of, exam of the examples here. Here we can see an example of a transverse or oblique fracture, a simple snap through, and then a displaced fracture where it actually fractured and separated and needs to be realigned. A spiral fracture, you can notice that it looks like it has been twisted apart, and a commuted fracture is a shattering of the bone where there are pieces everywhere. As we get older, we tend to have a loss in osteoblast activity and an increase in osteoclast activity. And when the osteoclast activity is greater than that of the osteoblast activity, bones become more porous. Think like Swiss cheese. Estrogen in women are going to keep a lot of the osteoclast activity under control, which is why menopause is so dangerous for bone mineral density. As women age, estrogen levels drop, so the osteoclast control is lost, and the osteoclast become overactive, so bones become very porous. And this is how it becomes osteoporosis, or the loss of bone mineral density. 